Welcome to chapter three of Bella Voce's A Musical Journey, an invitation to explore European music history. At this point in our journey, we're entering a period long known as the Renaissance, a period in early modern European history stretching from roughly 1400 to 1600, when a philosophical movement known as Renaissance humanism, thought by many to be sparked by Petrarch's close study and imitation, of classical authors swept through Europe, transforming society, their understanding of the past, and their understanding of their place in the cosmos. In this chapter, we'll be focusing on Franco-Flemish musicians of the 15th century and trying to understand their historical context, particularly with the rise and influence of the Italian Renaissance in the South. Over the course of the century, we'll see how these distinct regions of North and South gradually shape an international musical language. In our next chapter, we'll be looking at English music of the 16th century. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start by asking, what was the Renaissance? Most simply put, historians understand the Renaissance, literally French for rebirth, as a period of cultural changes that swept Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. And over the next eight episodes, we'll be exploring those historical trends and transformations in more detail, and how they shaped music. Some of those forces of change included the rise of humanism, or the deepening interest in studying, editing, and imitating texts of ancient Greece and Rome, the invention of movable type and the printing press, and the resulting boom of the printing industry and the book trade. European voyages of exploration, which reoriented the understanding of Europe's place in the world and opened up vast new wealth, along with the great human cost and legacy of colonialism, exploitation, and enslavement. And the crises of belief as secular powers, the scriptural focus of the Reformation, and advances in scientific inquiry and instruments challenged the authority of the church. Taken all together, these currents of change made for a dynamic period of inquiry and discovery that gradually remade European society. Whether through the scholarship of humanism, the proliferation of print, the cultural contacts of trade, banking, and diplomacy, or the exploration of the globe and the cosmos, the Renaissance is characterized by an accelerating exchange of ideas. The impetus for these interrelated developments occurs, by most accounts, in Italy, perhaps more specifically in Florence, and perhaps even more specifically with Petrarch in the mid-14th century. The Italian peninsula, with smaller competing states, wealth, trade routes, and richness in ancient manuscripts and ruins, was primed to initiate these changes. And Petrarch's passion for ancient manuscripts from discovering unknown manuscripts, to studying, commenting on, editing, and imitating them, to his very personal letters written to ancient figures like Cicero, inspired a deepening interest in getting back to the original sources, or in Latin, of returning ad fontes. Over the course of the next 250 years or so, first in Italy and then throughout Europe, Renaissance humanism, in a program of study that came to be known as the Studia Humanitatis, developed as an educational and cultural program that fostered written and spoken eloquence through critical study of ancient authors. To begin then, we enter the Italian Renaissance through a set of doors in the city of Florence that tell an early story of humanism and how it began to transform thought, the arts, and even cities in the exchange of ideas with the ancient world. In the year 1401, the Cloth Importers Guild in Florence sponsored a competition to design new doors for the Baptistry of St. John in Florence, which is one of the oldest buildings in the city, originating around 1059, and was the site of Dante's baptism. By 1401, rich with the profits of the wool industry that had flourished in Florence since the 1200s, the city had already experienced a building boom in the 1300s, including churches, monasteries, palaces, defensive walls, and a city hall now known as the Palazzo Vecchio. A monumental Gothic cathedral had begun construction in 1296 near the existing baptistry, including a bell tower designed by Giotto. But the puzzle of how to build a massive dome 
plus the destruction of the Black Death and its recurrences in the following decades, had left the cathedral itself unfinished. The competition for the baptistry doors ultimately pitted seven Tuscan sculptors and goldsmiths against one another, each challenged to design a bronze depiction of the story of the sacrifice of Isaac from the book of Genesis, a story of faith and deliverance, at a time when Florence was struck by a recurrence of the Black Death and imminently threatened by the military of the Duke of Milan. The judges were ultimately undecided between the submissions of two young goldsmiths, the elegant and graceful work of the young Lorenzo Giberti, or the more dramatic depiction by Filippo Brunelleschi. When the undecided judges asked the two of them to work in collaboration, Brunelleschi refused, forfeiting the entire commission to Giberti. Whose work would you have chosen and why? Let us know in the comments below. After the competition, Lorenzo Giberti's life work was indeed dedicated to the baptistry doors. He completed the North Doors, a masterpiece of Renaissance art, in 1422, and then was commissioned to design the East Doors, which took 27 years to complete and are known to this day, because of Michelangelo's appraisal, as the Gates of Paradise or the Porte del Paradiso. But the story doesn't end there. Brunelleschi reportedly renounced sculpture and left Florence for Rome. He set off for the ancient capital with his friend, the young and later famed sculptor Donatello, and he spent much of the next 15 years setting gems and making clocks to earn a living while indulging his desire to study in depth the ruins of ancient Rome. In 1418, he returned to Florence to compete in a new competition, one seeking an innovator to design and build the massive dome for the still unfinished Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore. This time, Brunelleschi won. Brunelleschi's dome would exceed in size even that of the Roman Pantheon, which had stood as the world's largest for over a millennium. His design and engineering innovation sprung from his study of the ancient world, and his creation stands as a monumental symbol to this day of the accomplishments of Renaissance Florence. What's more, Brunelleschi in 1420 completed a set of experiments on and drawings of buildings in Florence, which first articulated the concept of linear perspective using a single vanishing point. Linear perspective immediately influenced many Italian painters and sculptors, and indeed was a turning point in the history of Western art. The theory, rich with mathematics, geometry, and optics, was codified by his friend Leon Battista Alberti in the work De Pictura. Perspective enabled visual artists not only to accurately create the illusion of depth, but also to depict a single, unified scene addressed to a particular, subjective viewer set in a particular space. Interestingly, Brunelleschi's discovery of the system of perspective influenced his formal rival Giberti, whose gates of paradise on the east side of the baptistry employ linear perspective to beautiful effect. The doors of the baptistry are indeed alive with the stories of two artists whose work at once looks back to the ancients and shows the way forward. With the story of the baptistry doors of Florence, as we enter the Italian Renaissance, we can see the expressive power that the arts played in displaying civic virtue and magnificence. Powerful rulers in the polities of Italy in fact competed for the best artists who could express their values in the media of the day. As we'll see, this system of patronage existed throughout the wealthy cities of Europe, spurring a great exchange of tastes and ideas as it started an international competition for the best talents, whether painters, sculptors, architects, poets, or musicians. If we think about the Renaissance in music, we normally think of roughly the two centuries between about 1400 and 1600. Uh, and as with any large span of time, uh, we can find both continuities and breaks within this, uh, also relative to the period that came before and period after in terms of uh, musical language, uh, the uses of music, the purposes of music, how music was understood. All of these things together make this period um, work. There were the great choir schools, a system called the Maitrise system, which is uh, uh, places like Cambrai in the north or other uh, of these choir schools associated with the great cathedrals of what we now call northern France or um, southern Belgium uh, that really were engines of production. Dufay was a product of the choir school at Cambrai, and in fact he goes back there at the end of his career. These were places where these young musicians learned um, to make music, uh, 
uh, learn the forms, uh, learn to participate in the liturgy, because after all, the liturgy ran on two things, a capacity to manage the Latin and the liturgical texts, and a capacity to sing the melodies and elaborate them in appropriate ways uh, musically, uh, where these highly skilled musicians, you could think maybe this would be the equivalent of uh, the Naples conservatories in the 18th century, 17th and 18th century, which populated musical Europe with musicians and composers. Uh, every court wanted them. That's exactly what happened in this period where, um, uh, where patrons, uh, whether we're talking about in Burgundy or in, the, in Dijon or in Paris and the Royal Court in the Loire Valley, or uh, we actually have evidence that uh, patrons in Italy um, fought over each other. Something like uh, uh, the uh, owners of uh, great baseball or sports teams would fight over the best players. They recruited them. They hired them away. And there was actual um, sometimes intrigue as they would send musical spies to other courts to recruit these guys. Because it was conceived of for these patrons that to have the best choir was uh, a measure of your magnanimity, right? your magnificence to have the best choir. So having this was a luxury good at court. And uh, through a kind of a trick of the system of uh, support for officials in the Catholic Church, there was a system called the system of benefices. And this was a weird system that allowed, um, because of holdings of the local churches, uh, they would have income that would pay for observances at a particular church let's say it's near Cambrai in a little village, uh, a musician could hold that benefice, but actually not be resident in that church and instead sublet the job to somebody else who would actually do the services. And meanwhile, that musician would work at a place hundreds of miles away. And uh, one of the things that happened in the 15th and into the 16th century was that the patrons realized that through their connections in the Catholic church, a patron in, let's say, northern Italy or Dijon could have a musician working for his church and that musician could be gaining the funds from a benefice that he held way back in northern France. And this allowed Italian patrons basically to populate their own households with other people's money. And so these guys dominated the musical world of the elite uh, church and court chapels in Italy. So this is why we have many, many musicians. Josquin, Dufay goes to, goes to Florence. Josquin is in a number of churches. Um, into the 16th century, we have many of these people coming uh, south. And it's not until far into the 16th century that we start to get people like Luca Morenzio, a native-born Italian, who's actually able to take up the position of a, a court composer or a composer to a household. But the local musicians could not compete with this capacity to, of patrons to essentially uh, support their musicians and therefore buy the best musicians with money from another institution, essentially. And so this engendered um, this competition among patrons, but also this very irregular landscape between the northern musicians who could populate these remote chapels and the local musicians engendered a kind of great interchange of musical ideas where these complicated contrapuntal forms, kids who were learning from a very young age not only to harmonize music but actually to improvise little fugues. This is what they learned when they learned to make music. They learned to extemporize complicated patterns and they're actually surprisingly um, easy to understand. Uh, we've actually made a lot of progress in recent years uncovering this secret art of what was called singing upon the book, where you could extemporize, harmonize a melody, but also turn a melody into a little imitative point. Um, the local musicians could not compete with this, and yet the influx of those ideas, of that literate tradition, and its mixing with of course, there was a lot of local music being made in Italy, and a lot of it was unwritten because it involved improvisation or it impro involved um, declamation to the accompaniment of uh, a lute or a harp or accompaniment by another instrument. And this very textually oriented uh, declamation, if you like, mixed 
with northern polyphony. And the big story that people like to tell about the Renaissance is it is Italian singing style combined with northern polyphony. It's a truism, but there's actually, as with a lot of truisms, there's something productive about that. Allow me to introduce Guillaume Dufay. Oh, you've heard of him? Well, did you know that he was born out of wedlock in 1397 to a single woman and a priest? Despite this humble beginning, he went on to become a boy chorister at Cambrai Cathedral from 1409 to 1412, where he impressed his tutors. In 1427, he was ordained. His career as a priest and musician composer saw him travel to many parts of modern day France and Italy, including Cambrai in the north near Belgium, Savoie in the Western Alps, Bologna in Northern Italy, and to Rome and Florence. The scholar Alejandro Enrique Planchart wrote that Dufay, quote, was acknowledged by his contemporaries as the leading composer of his day. He held positions in many of the musical centers of Europe, and his music was copied and performed virtually everywhere that polyphony was practiced, end quote. Dufay's most famous work is probably the occasional motet, Nuper Grosarum Flores, written for the consecration of the glorious dome of Florence Cathedral, designed and built by Filippo Brunelleschi. For our first work in this episode, let's turn to another of Dufay's well-known occasional motets, Supremum Est Mortalibus. This motet was written to celebrate a peace treaty between his patron, Pope Eugenius IV, and King Sigismund of Hungary in the spring of 1433. This is memorialized in the motet itself as the beginning of each section invokes peace. Supremum est mortalibus is written in four vocal parts, the triplum, which we know as the highest, then the foberdon, directly under the triplum and moving with it in parallel motion, the interval of a fourth below, then the motetus, then the tenor. But this is a bit misleading because only three voices are ever singing at any given time, the tenor disappearing when the foberdon sings. So we have just one singer, our very own Garrett Johansson, singing both of those parts. Dr. Richard Friedman tells us in his book, Music in the Renaissance, that the text is organized in four distinct sections. Five couplets define both natural and human activities in which peace prevails. A further three praise peace itself. And the final couplet names the peacemakers, Eugenius and Sigismund. The tenor line briefly quotes a section of chant, which brings to mind Saints John and Paul, obviously to favorably compare the dedicatees to them. The motet is organized using a technique known as isorhythm, a technique with which we became familiar in our last chapter. Dufay, a Burgundian member of the first generation of the Franco-Flemish composers, is here making linkages to the practice of the medieval past. Let's listen to the motet Supremum Est Mortalibus, written for the peace treaty between Pope Eugenius IV and King Sigismund of Hungary. Ooh. 
Did you hear those parallel fourths? Aren't they stunning and singular? They still sound very medieval to me. Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Let's continue with music of Jufai, but this time turning toward a secular song. Par le Regard by Guillaume Jufai was a hugely popular song, appearing in dozens of sources from the second half of the 15th century, most notably in the Melon Chansonnier, created in Naples for Princess Beatrice of Aragon. Par le Regard is actually a bit old fashioned, especially when you consider it was written as late as 1450. The poem is a rondo, which, as we learned in chapter two, when we studied the Remède de Fortune by Machaut, is one of the old form fixes or fixed forms. Dr. Friedman teaches us in his book that composers in the 14th and 15th century created these poems in two sections corresponding with the two halves of the poem. The midpoint creates a cadence which allows singers to repeat the A section or go on to the B as desired. The tenor part forms a duet with the cantus, moving in syncopated parallel sixths until they meet in octaves to mark each rhyme. This serves to emphasize the end rhymes beaulieu, désireux, and gratia. In some modern day renditions of Par le Regard, you might hear three singers perform this, or perhaps two singers and a lute. Or as we've decided, one singer on the cantus part, which is the only part that is clearly texted, and two VLs, an early bowed fiddle-like instrument. We are grateful to our friends at the Newberry Consort for procuring and playing these VLs for us. If we were to glance at the piece Par le Regard by Dufay, the Chanson, or his motet Supremum et Motabilis, in terms of their forms, uh, that is the poetic shape, or the procedure in the case of Supremum, which involves a complicated manipulation of tenor voices and then an architecture of parts that appear above it. Uh, uh, these pieces are in some ways indistinguishable in their shapes or procedures from the music of the 14th century. They inherit a long legacy of that idiom, but they also look forward uh, in many ways to new sounds. They uh, mark out the influence of English musicians in the 15th century who brought this new sensibility of the um, fluency and currency of imperfect thirds and sixths as part of the musical vocabulary. Let's listen to the rondo Par le Regard by Guillaume Dufay, beautifully sung by Nora Anganopoulos and played by David Douglas and Brandy Berry Benson. <laughs> 
Don't you love the sound of the VLs? I think that using these two instruments as opposed to another combination of musicians highlights the upper voice and helps make the text more audible and intelligible. In this episode, we finally left the medieval period, which spanned about 1,000 years, and entered the Renaissance. The intellectual movement known as humanism is sweeping across Europe. We met Guillaume Dufay, a Burgundian priest and musician who is known as the first and most important composer of a group that is later to be dubbed the Franco-Flemish School of Polyphony. Do you have some favorite works of Dufay that you would like to share with our growing Bella Voce community? Please share in the comments section below. If you've enjoyed this episode, please click the like button and if you haven't already, subscribe to follow future episodes. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this first foray into the Renaissance and the music of the Franco-Flemish school. Next time, we're going to consider the contrast between North and South in this period and the music of two distinct voices of a new generation in the Franco-Flemish school. Thank you.